Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. John's. I I woke up today and I kind of thought to myself, I wonder how many Virginia fans I'll see in church this morning. Are they out, you know, too late last night? But then I thought about the game a little bit and I thought Virginia fans should be in church today thanking God for the most fortuitous foul in the history of the world. I'm glad you're here. We gather together as a community, um, and many of you know this, that have been around here and know the people within this community well, know that this has been a week of grief within this community because of the sudden death of Walt Peake on Wednesday. And his funeral will be at one. If you are coming back, or if you're staying, um, please know if you're coming back that the parking's gonna be very limited and our friends at Second Presbyterian have invited us to use their parking lots for that service. Nancy and the kids, as you can imagine, are just absolutely devastated and yet they very much feel the love and affection that you all have shown them Um, and it's really been remarkable to witness that outpouring of love. They're very important people in my life here, as short as my time has been here in just under five years, um, because I probably wouldn't be here without the Peaks, because Nancy was the co-chair of the search committee um, that brought me here, and when Shelly came up to, to find us a place to live, she stayed with Nancy and Walt Peak, and what she said on the night of his death, what, you know, and just absolute, you know, just kind of horrid, that that had occurred, she said, I knew that it was gonna be okay to move here because Roanoke has people like Walt and Nancy Peake. It's a tremendous loss, and um, those of you who knew him and love him, I'm so sorry for it, and yet I'm glad that we're sharing this time together. In your worship leaflet, You'll find the parish announcements. There's all kinds of things that are going on within the church, um, and you're going to be glad I'm not going to recite all of them for you. I would ask you to pay attention if you have any interest in the women's retreat that is coming up, and they've extended the sign-ups. There's a great group of people coming, but they want everybody to have a chance, so please ask questions about that. Consider it. Uh, Talk to Whitney Burton about it if you um, want to, to get some more details. We're having a rector's reception coming up in May that'll be at my house. And this is for people who are new to the church, who are reconnecting with the church, Um, just a chance to get to know each other better. Um, And so please consider that as well as our explorers class slash adult confirmation class. We started this morning, had a great group, about 20 of us um, together, and this is geared around learning more about uh, the Episcopal Church in in, um, general and and, uh, St. John in particular and all that goes into uh, this thing called Anglicanism and this great tradition of which we're a part. Please do uh, look at all the uh, announcements within there on your own and just know it's good to be together particularly today as, a, as the body of Christ, and I'm glad you're here. Let's worship God.
Bless the Lord, who forgives all our sins. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. May all that I say be to the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God's message for us today is quite simple, and yet it's the best sort of simple. It's simply good. It's a simply good message that God's not done at all. Working in this world, God's not done at all. Working in our lives, God, another way to put it, is still alive. God's still acting, still loving, still speaking, still elbowing his way into this world in a million ways we could never even guess. And yet through faith, somehow increasingly have eyes to see. The simple good news for us today is God's not done Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. See, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? With these words, Isaiah insists that God remains at work. And God's best work, in fact, lies ahead. God is working right now. God's moving forward. As we speak, God is a plan for today and for tomorrow. God didn't pause or turn back or sit down or sit still or sit this one out. God didn't take a break or decide, I think I've had enough. That'll do. No, God didn't wear out or wear down. God didn't take a breather. God's acting right now, moving this moment. God for each and every one of us is going ahead of us. All of which means the best things about your life, your precious life, they don't just exist in the rearview mirror of your life. And yet, that's hard to accept some days, isn't it? Certainly hard to accept some weeks, like this week, when we lost what? I mean, even at our most optimistic, it's still hard to embrace an uncertain future. And after all, what other sort of future is there? Especially if we love the past, or really even just the now. It's terribly difficult not to cling to a cherished past. Certainly, I'm inclined to do that. I mean, everybody who knows me even a little knows I like to get things in order and then hold them tight. Hold them right there, as long as possible. Things are finally right, I think. I've got it together, fixed, nailed down, established. So let me cling to this present right now so that some future wrong doesn't intrude. Because after all, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Everything's uncertain in the future. 
All you really know about the future is change is inevitable with the future, and change is always ripe ground for a harvest of concern. And so it's just better to hold on to what you got now, because who knows about scary tomorrow. And yet, here's the thing. God, well, God isn't afraid of tomorrow. God's not afraid of the future. Listen to him. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. See, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? You know, amazingly, Isaiah says this. He tells his hearers to not remember the former things or consider the things of old immediately after he himself talks about former things and considers the things of old. I don't know if you listened to that in the, in the lesson, but it's right there. Isaiah speaks about this great triumph that was the Exodus story of his, of his uh, ancestors. He revels in this wonderful, sacred history of God bringing the Hebrew slaves, his people in ancient times out of slavery in Egypt into freedom. But then Isaiah immediately pivots, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old, to which we might rightly say, Isaiah, you just spoke about the former things and considered the things of old and then told us not to remember the former things or consider the things of old. So if you you wouldn't mind, would you make up your mind? But see, I think we misunderstand Isaiah if we see his statement as somehow mutually exclusive between the past and the future. What, what I mean is there are multiple ways to read a cherished past that impact very differently our sense of the future. For instance, it, it's totally possible to look at the past as inspiration for the future. To remember how God acted back then and moved in times gone by in order to perceive how God might continue to act now and move forward in times to come. I mean, when you see that God was alive yesterday, you begin to remember, aha, God's still alive today. And God's going to remain alive tomorrow. And at least to me, that's the proper way to consider the things of old. But there's another way to read the past, and it's in such a way that the past becomes kind of a trap. And this is the reading of the past that's done not to learn from it or to look forward to it, but only to reminisce about things gone by as though that was all that there could ever be. To replay the past over and over and over again as a never-ending loop that never allows you to move beyond it. Ah, the past. The glory days never to be repeated. Good times can't be replicated. That cherished bygone era when God was still alive back then. See, this was the precise misreading of the past that was being done by the people to whom Isaiah spoke these words in the first place. See, at the time that Isaiah spoke these words about God's new future, the people of Israel were suffering a terrible present. So much so that I guess some of them just kind of quit believing that God was even present in the present. The situation was they were in Babylon, this great mighty power. Babylon comes and takes over Israel, the southern part of it known as Judah, destroys the temple, decapitates the leadership in essence and sends all of them to Babylon in exile. And so that's when Isaiah comes along with these words. For this suffering people taken by force from their homes into a pagan land, their their present was a promised land overrun, a temple in ruins, subjugation to a foreign enemy intent on destroying any future that they could possibly imagine. Now they sat there and they knew their stories of old. They knew stories like the Exodus, these other older times when other older powers like Egypt held their ancestors helpless against their will in a foreign land, exactly their situation there, and of how God acted then, but they just thought that's just back then. That history's 
gone. It's remote. It's ancient. And yet, it wasn't gone for Isaiah. Isaiah read his divine history as prelude, as upcoming events. And so Isaiah sees God's movement through history, and he realizes we have a God on our hands who's on the move through history. He realizes that the God who acted yesterday might just still be alive today and might just have plans for tomorrow. And thus Isaiah sees a new exodus about to take place again for his people, a God once again wrapping the people of God up into the arms of God's care and like in times gone by, about to take them into a future that couldn't be except by God's own making. Isaiah Isaiah somehow sees that what God did so long ago for those Hebrew slaves, God's about to do again for these exiles, even though they quit believing in the future. And I think Isaiah's stretching all the way to today and saying to you and saying to me, we must remember that God's future lies beyond us too. Because God's not done with you. God's not done with me. God's not done with us. God's not done with this church. God's not done with this creation. Our God is marching on. Now, maybe you're not 100% there right now. Maybe your present circumstances don't allow you much traction to walk boldly into the future. Maybe your feet slip and slide in doubt, and I get that. I think it's okay to be uncertain. It's okay to doubt. I mean, notice that Jesus was not put on a cross by people with doubts. People who put Jesus on the cross were full of certitude, and I don't know about you, but as I read life, it's not always obvious to me exactly in every particular moment when and where God's acting in life. And yet, here's the thing. I've read my past enough to see God's hand undeniably at work within it. And the greatness of God's work in my past far exceeds my ability to doubt God's presence back there. And once I really see God back there, once I recognize God's undeniable presence back there, then it becomes not so overly hard to believe that God's still very much here, even when I don't immediately sense God here. And then it becomes a little bit easier to believe that the same God who was faithful to me in my past will remain faithful to me throughout my future. Because with this sort of God, past is always prelude. In the book of Genesis, there's this wonderful story where Abraham and Sarah received these three surprise visitors at the Oaks of Mamre. Now, this story has it that these three strangers come to Abraham and Sarah's camp, and, and Abraham thinks it's wonderful, and he makes this tremendous feast for them, and he shows them all this hospitality, not even knowing who they are. But Sarah, being more realistic, only sees three strangers. What do they bring? Are they dangerous? So she stands back and just listens to what they have to say. Well, what they have to say is that the promises of of God for Abraham and Sarah being the parents of nations, that all of that is still going to come true. That they're going to have a baby even though they're in their 80s, which they won't, but sounds terrible to me. That even though their past screams out barren, even though their history insists that there's nothing new possible for their future, the visitors say, God's still got a future. Now, we don't know exactly how Abraham hears all this news, but we do know how Sarah receives it. Sarah laughs. Sarah laughs because it's ridiculous. She laughs because she's too old for new things, especially new baby things. She laughs because she knows the world and barren past don't yield fertile futures. She laughs because she lives in a flat world 
where nothing ever changes, where God doesn't intrude, where three visitors are just three visitors and not divine ambassadors. She laughed because she believed that it's out and out impossible for anything new to break into this dead old world. But nine months later, she laughed again after a birth, a promised birth in the flesh and a son born out of her barren past named Isaac. Isaac, a name that literally means laughter. And with that name, it's like God saying, guess who always gets the last laugh? What sort of a world is it within which we live? Do we live in a world where God's at all live? into which God will ever intrude, a world where God acts and moves and speaks, well, if you have just a little bit of hope of that, I encourage you to allow it to grow and take heart. Because if so, God hasn't stopped acting, speaking, or intruding. Because after all, if God was alive yesterday, God hasn't quit being alive today. And God will remain alive tomorrow. Because with this God, past is always prelude. Do not remember the former things. Or consider the things of old. See, I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Perceive it. Amen. Let us respond with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made, for us and for our salvation, down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our bishop, for St. John's Episcopal Church, Withville, Virginia, as our bishop is with them, and for all the clergy and people, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this city, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those named on our parish prayer list, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died, especially Walt Peake, for those we remember on the anniversaries of their deaths, as named on our parish prayer list, and for those who have died this week in service to their country, let us pray to the Lord. that we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the communion of blessed John the Evangelist and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. You, O oh Lord, our God. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, Help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Please offer each other the hand of peace. Peace be with you. Peace, peace, Wales. Let me just say, as our children are walking in, that it is a pleasure to see you here today and to worship with you. Now, as you know, we move to God's table, the table that is the Lord's, and all, <clears throat> excuse me, all baptized Christians are welcome to come and share the sacrament with us. If you would prefer a blessing, cross your arms over your chest, and we will be happy to pronounce God's blessing upon you. Now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and prayers. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
declare in the name of God in this congregation, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We We who are are many are one one body, because we all share one bread, one one cup. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. in peace to love and serve the Lord.